In the New Testament, Hebrews is not alone in its Jewish flavor and focus. The book following Hebrews, the epistle of James, also addresses a distinctly Jewish audience. James 1.1 1, 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. Helping to identify the relationship of the author to his Jewish audience, both the writer and the recipients addressed Abraham as father. James 2.21, thus understandably identifying each other as brethren. James 1, 2, 16 and 19, James 2, 1, 5 and 14, James 3, 1, 10 and 12, James 4, 11, James 5, 7, 9, 10, 12 and 19. This reference to brethren relates more to their relationship as kinsmen according to the flesh, Romans 9, 3, rather than the spiritual kinship enjoyed by all brethren in Christ. Like Hebrews, the reader finds an emphasis in James upon those of historical prominence to the Jews. The writer enlisted Abraham in James chapter 2, the prophets and Elias in James chapter 5, to teach the intended audience the specified truths conveyed. Jews highly regarded their Jewish ancestry, and it would have been fruitless to attempt to reach them by ignoring the Jewish fathers and their heritage. Just the use of the word Gentiles often caused Jews to respond with hatred and a deaf ear toward the truth. Paul found this to be the case. As the Jews gave him audience unto this word, Gentiles, then suggested it is not fit that he should live. That response was quite indicative of the Jews' reaction for those outside their nationality, especially in a religious context. Acts 22.21 and he said unto me, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. And they gave him audience unto this word, and then lifted up their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. The Lord experienced the same type of negative response from the Jews during his earthly ministry. The Jews who greatly marveled at Christ's promise of favor toward them, Luke 4:14 4, through 22 quickly desired his death when he testified of Elijah's ministry to the Gentiles, Luke 4, 25-29. Who wrote James? Equally important for understanding the Jewish nature of the epistle is the identification of its human author. In addition to the author of this epistle demonstrating a profound appreciation for the Old Testament law, James 1, 27, Exodus 22, 22, he was also quite familiar with the words spoken by the Lord Jesus Christ during his earthly ministry. To substantiate the similarities, consider 20 parallels between the book of James and Christ's words he ministered while upon the earth. 1. Asking without wavering. The epistle of James, chapter 1. James 1, 6. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. This is compared to Christ's words. Mark 11:22. And Jesus answered and saith unto him, Have faith in God, for verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast in the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, What things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Number two, man likened to the grass. The epistle of James, chapter 1, James 1, 11, For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth. Then the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Compared with Christ's words, Matthew 6, 30, Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast in the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Number three, ye do err. The epistle of James, chapter 1. James 1, 16. Do not err, my beloved brethren. James 5, 19. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, compared with Christ's words. Matthew 22, 29. Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. Number four, good gifts from God in heaven. The epistle of James, chapter 1. James 1.17, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Compared with Christ's words, Matthew 7.11, If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? Number five, the need for cautious speech. The epistle of James, chapter 1. 
James 1, 19, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, compared with Christ's words. Matthew 5, 22, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Number six, doers of the word. James 1, 22, But be ye doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. Compared with Christ's words, Matthew seven twenty one. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Verse twenty four. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. Number seven. The poor heirs of the kingdom. The Epistle of James, chapter two, James two five. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him? Compared with Christ's words, Luke 6.20, And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed be ye poor, for yours the kingdom of God. Number eight, the merciful obtain mercy. The epistle of James chapter 2, James 2.13, For he shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment compared with Christ's words Matthew 5 7 blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy number nine no faith no foundation the epistle of James chapter 2 James 2 14 what doth it profit my brethren though a man say he hath faith and have not works can faith save him compared with Christ's words Luke 6 49 but he that heareth and doeth not is like a man without a foundation built a house upon the earth against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Number 10, give to those who ask. The epistle of James, chapter 2, James chapter 2, verse 15, If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Compared with Christ's words, Matthew 5, 42, Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Flattering titles reprimanded. The epistle of James, chapter 3. James 3, 1, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. Compared with Christ's words, Matthew 23, 8. Matthew 23, 8. But be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. Verse 14. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer, therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Number 12. By their fruits. The Epistle of James, chapter 3. James 3.11, Doth the fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either of vine, figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Compared with Christ's words, Matthew 7.16, Ye know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Verse 20, Wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. Number 8, The Peacemakers. The Epistle of James, chapter 3, James 3.18, And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Compared with Christ's words, Matthew 5.9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Number 14, Ask and Receive. The Epistle of James, chapter 4, James 4.2, Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain, ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Compared with Christ's words, Matthew 7, 7. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Number 15, the laughter turned into mourning. The epistle of James, chapter 4. James 4, 9. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Compared with Christ's words, Luke 6, 25. Woe unto you that are full. For ye shall hunger. 
Woe unto you that laugh now, for ye shall mourn and weep. Number 16, the humble are exalted. The epistle of James, chapter 4. James 4.10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Compare with Christ's words, Luke 14.11. For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Number 17, moth-eaten and corrupted riches. The epistle of James, chapter 5. James 5.1. Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten, your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Compared with Christ's words, Matthew 6:19, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. Swear not by heaven or earth. The epistle of James chapter 5. James 5.12 But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any oath, but let your yea be yea and your nay be nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. Compared with Christ's words, Matthew 5.34 But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is the footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communication be, yea, yea, nay, nay. For whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. Number 19, the sick anointed with oil. The epistle of James, chapter 5. James 5, 14. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he hath committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Compared with Christ's words, Mark 6.13. And they cast out many devils, anointed with oil, many that were sick, and healed them. Number 20, confessing faults one to another. The epistle of James, chapter 5. James 5.16. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Compared with Christ's words, Matthew 18, 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. At a minimum, these 20 comparisons should settle the matter concerning the author's unique familiarity to the words of Christ. These proofs may settle this matter, but the disagreement widens when considering the precise authorship of the book of James. No doubt the writer attempts to appeal to his Jewish audience and that Jesus is the promised Messiah, the Christ. This parallels the confession made to Philip that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, Acts 8.37. Obviously, the book of James was written by a man named James. But which of the several James mentioned in Scripture? Was it James, the son of Zebedee? and brother of John, Matthew 10, 2? Or was it James, the son of Alphaeus, Matthew 10, 3? Or was it James, the Lord's brother, Mark 6, 3? The debate rages. One would assume the close association of the book of James to the words of Christ would most likely point to one of the two apostles named James. However, the author of the book of James, unlike Paul, Romans 1, 1, and Peter, 1 Peter 1, 1, in their epistles never buttressed his authority by pointing to an apostleship. Interestingly, there was one James whose authority was on the rise while the others were waning. This was James, the Lord's brother. During the early part of Christ's ministry, his siblings, including James, did not believe on him, James 7, 5. Although not a believer at the time, James could have been familiar with the Lord's ministry and teachings. Matthew 12, 46-50, John 2, 12, John 7, 1-6. Perhaps James' conversion came during the visit of the resurrected Savior, 1 Corinthians 15, 7, but it certainly occurred prior to the day of Pentecost when he was numbered among those who continued with one accord in prayer and supplication, Acts 1, 14. James' rise to a prominent position was undeniable. He ascended from a nameless inclusion at the day of Pentecost to a pillar in the church at Jerusalem some years later, Galatians 2, 9. In fact, at the Jerusalem Council, James appeared to be the primary spokesman for those assembled together, Acts 15, 13 through 21. Prior to the day of Pentecost, the Lord admonished his followers to evangelize the world once the Holy Ghost was come upon them, Acts 1, 8. They refused to heed this admonition and instead built their little kingdom in Jerusalem. In order to accomplish his will and scatter the saints, the Lord allowed persecution, Acts 8, 1. Interestingly, 
Those who remain in the church at Jerusalem evidently chose James to become the church's pastor. One thing that is clear about James is that he never relinquished his zeal concerning his Jewish heritage. In fact, when Paul arrived in Jerusalem, his hopes of reaching the Jews with the gospel the grace of God were met with some concerns from the pastor. James' concerns were twofold. First, that Paul needed to understand that believing Jews still held the law of Moses in high esteem, and secondly, that it was important that the Jews not think Paul had abandoned Moses' circumcision or the Jewish customs. Acts 21.20, And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are zealous of the law. And they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. Paul desired to pacify these fears because he longed to minister to his brethren according to the flesh, the Jews. To convince the Jews that Paul walketh orderly and keepeth the law, James admonished him to join others in taking a vow. Yet James felt compelled to remind Paul that believing Gentiles were excluded from such observations. This is 30 years after the Feast of Pentecost recorded in the book of Acts. There is simply no excuse for them to still be clinging to Jewish practices. Acts 21:24. Them take and purify thyself with them, and be at charges with them, that they may shave their heads, and all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing, but that thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepest the law. As touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing, save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols and from blood and from strangled and from fornication. Some might find it difficult to believe that the brother of the Lord Jesus refused to believe on him until sometime after his resurrection. One would think with James' love of the old covenant, he would have readily recognized and received the Messiah that the covenant promised. However, those most fervent on behalf of the law often found it difficult to reconcile their zeal for the law with the believing on the Lord. Interestingly, this may have been the driving force that caused James not to believe until after Christ's resurrection. Things become less complicated when one realizes that the Lord Jesus never spoke a word against the law. In fact, the Lord said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Matthew 5, 17. After conversion, James, along with other Jews, saw no conflict in both loving the law and promoting the teachings of Christ. This is very important for understanding the writings that focus primarily upon the Jews. The timing and purpose of the epistle of James. Although we cannot be completely certain as to the timing of its authorship, the epistle offers some internal clues. When James wrote to the Jews, he mentioned that the Jews were scattered abroad, James 1.1, 1, 1, and facing diverse temptations, James 1.2. Both statements reflect the same situation recorded in Acts chapter 8. In fact, after the four Gospels, the phrase scattered abroad is only found four times with one occurrence found in James 1.1, 1, 1, the other three point to the fallout from the persecution in Acts chapter 8. That is Acts 8.1, 8, 8.4, and 11.19. Acts 11.19. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that rose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenix and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. This historical period recorded in Acts was marked by a strong Jewish evangelistic emphasis Jewish exclusivity to some. Since these scattered abroad ones were disciples of Christ, the early believers only directed their efforts at Jews. Thus, they did indeed go to Jews who were scattered abroad. Repeatedly, we are told that the truly faithful believers considered all their possessions communal. Acts 2.44 And all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. Acts 4.32 And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul, neither said any of them that ought of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. The hoarding of possessions by believers was viewed as a refusal to minister to others. One can imagine why the rich would be viewed with this type of disdain expressed in the latter chapter of James. James 5.1 Go to now, you rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, your garments are moth-eaten, your gold and silver is cankered, and the rest of them shall be a witness against you. 
and shall eat your flesh as it were fire, ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth, and the cries of them which have reaped are entered in the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. The early believers rightfully viewed accumulated wealth as corrupted riches, moth-eaten garments, cankered and rusted gold and silver. These hoarded riches were a witness against the rich then and will be in the future too. Additionally, they fraudulently cheated their laborers. These practices sound curiously like the hypocrisy of Ananias and Sapphira, Acts 5, 1 through 10. Wealth is also a problem in the book of Revelation with many references to this phenomenon. One such example points to the grief expressed at the loss of the opportunity to gain wealth or influence after the destruction of the great city of Babylon. The admonition given by James concerning anointing the sick with oil is likewise intriguing, James 5, 14 and 15, because it serves a Jewish practice and sign paralleling the ministries of Christ and the apostles. Mark 6, 13. And they cast out many devils and anointed with oil, many that were sick, and healed them. So what were James' purposes in writing to these persecuted and scattered Jews? He wrote with three primary purposes. One, to encourage them to endure the present temptations, James 1, 2 through 4, and 12. Two, to admonish them to manifest their faith through obedience, James 1, 19 through 27, James 2, 1 through 26. And number three, to remind them of the importance of their fellowship with one another, James 3, 1 through 18, James 4, 1 through 17, James 5, 1 through 20. Understandably, the persecuted Jews needed such encouragement. James' message was exactly what these Jews needed to help them find joy during diverse temptations. The troubles were intended for their perfection. If they needed wisdom, they simply needed to seek the Lord who would liberally give it to them, who would liberally give it to those who asked, James 1, 5. If they grew weary during their tumultuous times, they could simply reflect upon the ministries of the persecuted prophets or devilish temptations in the life of Job, James 5.11, relegating James to the Jews. No doubt James' primary intended audience was Jewish in ancestry. However, the Bible student must refuse the temptation of assuming that the book of James is irreconcilable with Paul's writings. Both men wrote to their kinsmen according to the flesh one rather early, James, and one later in time, Paul. The difference in the two epistles demonstrate the doctrinal transitions brought about by time and further revelation. The similarities declare a mutual burden shared by two men who were born Jews and yet came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Although the audience was primarily Jewish, many of those Jews believed on the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. As fellow believers, much of what applied to them applies to the church today. Yet the scripture's progressive illumination affords Christians a greater overall understanding today. Since God is still in the business of enlightening the eyes and the minds of the saints to truths already contained within scripture, the church today has a clearer understanding of how to rightly divide the scriptures than did previous generations. Daniel 12.4 Many of the early believers concentrated upon the Sermon on the Mount and other teachings directed toward the Jews because that was their audience. However, these early saints did the best they could with the light they possessed. Think about it. Frequently, with far less light, they showed themselves superior in faithfulness and overall godliness than does the average church member today. This should not be the case. This is the end of chapter 17.